Hey folks, I'm happy to invite and, and to welcome uh, our artistic and general director of San Diego Opera, who is also the stage director for A Murder in the Cathedral by Pizzetti, Ian Campbell. Ian, welcome. Glad to be with you. Good to have you here. Um, let's go back to the beginning. What is it about Murder in the Cathedral that first attracted you, and what's the story involved in that attraction? When did you first come upon this piece? Well, I first came upon it in the 1970s. It premiered, remember, in the 50s. 59. 59. Mm -hmm. But I was given a pirate uh, open reel tape of it. Of the premiere? Of the premiere. And I listened to it in Adelaide, Australia, where I was running the State Opera of South Australia. Fell in love with it because of the grandeur of the piece, the remarkable use of chorus, the fact it's a great historical story. And I wanted to do it there, but didn't. And finally, I can do it here because everything falls into place. We've got the right company and the right cast. Now, was there something specific about the music that attracted you? Yes. Along with the grandeur of the story and all that, what about the music was it that... I just found it so fascinating that it was in the classic Italian style and yet a bit different yeah. because it has some chant in it. It lacks uh, set arias, really. Right. It's a conversation but a dramatic one. It's not like uh, Richard Ateef. It, it really has power mm -hmm. in everything that's going on. No, it is rather like a, a musical setting of a straight play, which it actually is since it's based on the T.S. Eliot Absolutely. drama. When people say to me, how do I get into it? I say, read the Eliot. Yeah. If, you, if you read the play, you know what's going to happen in the opera because it's merely a concise version of the play. If you sang every word in the play, it would take too long. Mm -hmm. But it's been beautifully adapted and uh, the story flows, it's dramatic, act one ends on a high dramatic note that right. makes you want to come back for act two. And the characters are quite real, apart from the tempters, but the tempters are really in his mind. Right, we have to, we have to say for our audience that there are four tempters who come to Thomas Beckett uh, and tempt him, actually, to, to try to escape from this vice that he's found himself in between uh, the church and the state in the, in the person of Henry II. And, and even that moment where the tempters come in, we've all been through that. We've all gone through situations where we mentally weigh up. If I do this, this will happen. Right. If they do that, this will happen. So although it's a dramatic conceit, it works so well that you don't feel uncomfortable with Beckett almost talking to the air because he never really addresses these people straight on. They are physically on stage, right. but he doesn't talk to them. He's talking to himself. They're expressing uh, the options that are in his mind. And the story is so direct because it, it takes place within a month, and it's Thomas's arrival back from exile. After seven years. After yeah. seven years, and it's what happens in that month right. at Canterbury. The whole setting is inside the cathedral. Mm -hmm and we see him coming back being warned by the female chorus, which again is a fascinating thing. They're a kind of Greek chorus, mm -hmm. but whereas the Greek chorus traditionally uh, commented but didn't get involved, this chorus does get involved, so you can't play them as a classic Greek chorus. They are spoken to, yeah. therefore they're, they're real, they're recognized, Thomas speaks to them, priests speak to them. So they moving in and out of the action, commenting, moving the action forward, make Act One very, very interesting. And then the tempters come in and they try to tell Thomas, uh, ultimately, that the final one, the fourth one, uh, the martyr lives beyond the king. Right. And right. that's one of the turning points where you think maybe Beckett wants to be killed right. because he wants to be a martyr. I don't think it's true. But of course that would be suicide. It would, it, you know, from the Christian standpoint, and certainly from his standpoint in the, in the 12th century, to actually actively seek martyrdom would be the worst possible thing to do. Exactly. So what what we see him do is say, it's up to God. Right. I put myself in God's hands. And there's a fine line there very, between very. seeking martyrdom and then saying, ultimately, whatever is God's will is my will. Yeah. He does a sermon that opens the second act in which he refers to this, that the martyr should not seek martyrdom, but it can happen. And he warns the female chorus and the priests who are hearing the sermon that there may be another martyr. Right. And uh, he's predicting that it may happen to him. And sure enough, in the second act, the knights come in and uh, 
tell him that he's got to uh, change excommunications and other things that have caused trouble between him and the king. He refuses. They say they'll come back with weapons. They do, and they kill him, and it ends in a glorious chorus, praising God. And in our setting, they will be worshipping mm. um, Saint Thomas, because that's mm. what he became yeah, very, very quickly. I, uh, uh, you were speaking of the chorus earlier, and I find it fascinating uh, that the chorus in the opera is more convincing to me than the chorus in the play, when it's done as a straight play. I think it works better for them to actually sing. And it's, it's true. I think opera brings so much to life because of the combination of the singing and the music. I think any play coming from the page into the opera house is always improved. I've seldom felt that something should have been left on the page, as it were. Yeah. And this chorus, um, they, they really color everything that's happening. Even when they say metaphorically to Beckett, don't come back. Right. You know, go back to France. We know there's danger. They're also confused. They're not quite sure why they are there at the very beginning. They say, why are we here? Yeah, there's a lot Is of it, foreboding and fear of the future and, and what's going to happen. That's where the music can color it, yeah. far, more than, far more than a play. Yeah. The other thing to me that is interesting is I've directed a lot of operas, but never, as I can recall, one that is so close to history. You know, we have people like um, Don Carlo who existed in history, but we don't really know what they said. And, and, <laughs> and the connection between the real Don Carlo and the operatic Don Carlo is so, so wide. I mean, they're not exactly. even close. Uh, the real Don Carlo was nowhere near a hero that, that he Definitely is. Definitely not, in the and, and he wasn't a very healthy person but either. Indeed. But if you if you read any biography of Beckett or read some of the uh, the constitutions of Clarendon, things that were creating conflict, they are mentioned in this opera, and a lot of what Beckett says can be traced back. Right. to things he wrote or records that were kept of, of discussions. And of course his murder was witnessed and uh, written down. And written down. down, yeah, exactly. exactly. Now, we won't be scraping his brains out, <laughs> which is unfortunately what happened to him. But we can, we can see this true historic line with a true character, mm -hmm. an event that was major in the Catholic Church, because it was a Catholic Church, not the Church of England. Right, right. That came a lot this later. Is like 300 years before. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And in trying to create the character since he died in his early 50s, I want to make sure that we show that he's not an old man. He's not the Pope. He's not somebody limping along. And he was a very vigorous man. He had been he a was warrior. A, a, a sporting man, uh, yep. very much involved in uh, duels and the military, and he, his favorite sport was falconry, Falcon. and he, he was a great horseback uh, a, a rider, a horseman. And he, he led campaigns in France yeah, for exactly. the king. Mm -hmm. So what we need to do, he, he was certainly older and worn out uh, when he came back to Canterbury, but there's still a bit of the warrior in him, and when the knights come in, we need to see him stand up to them, because they go away the first time. They're, they're, almost driven out by him, which is what I'd like to show. Yeah. And uh, he then becomes resigned that God will do what God will do. Now, we have, uh, in my opinion, I'm sure in your opinion as well, the greatest acting, singing bass in the world today, Ferruccio Furlanetto singing uh, the role of, of Thomas Beckett. How did he come to this role, do you know? How he first, uh, I don't know how he first came to it, but it was some time ago. He's, he's sung it several times, most recently at La Scala. Right. But it's one of his key roles, along with Don Quixote, which we've done here with him, Boris Goodenough, which we've done with him, King Philip, he sang his first American King Philip with us. And he is obviously a friend of the company and a personal friend of mine for more than 30 years. But what he brings is extraordinary talent, uh, depth of understanding of this character, he won't play it with me the way he played it at La Scala, because I have different ideas. The, the La Scala production was very ritualistic. Mm -hmm. I want this to have a, a greater sense of reality. And Ferruccio and I have already had discussions about things I want him to do, not a problem. He's an adaptable actor singer. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Uh, so, going with that as stage director, is the, you've already said you want to get a, a more realistic uh, 
color, a uh, more realistic atmosphere. How are you going to do that? Can you give, give us a couple of examples of, of how it's going to be more realistic? Well, in the, in the first rehearsals, we're going to play it like a play. Mm -hmm. And you say, where, where would you be? How would you be behaving? Uh, um, and that will come from the singers very, very easily. The chorus will be the difficult thing because although they're not involved constantly, they, I want them there observing. So they may not leave the stage. These are things that get negotiated during rehearsals. Right. But my instinct is they're always there. And they are every man. They are uh, the people who have forebodings, they have a sense of what's happening, but they can't change the action. They're capable of, uh, from what they say, of saying to Becca, there are lights outside. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. uh, but they never do. It's the priests who do it. Yeah. Whereas they, they knew this danger was coming. So how we use them is going to be uh, very interesting. The priests, um, the knights, they will work very logically as real people. The tricky one is going to be the tempters, because this is where Frucho and the tempter and I have to find a way to register that is that it's in his mind, mm -hmm. but also that it's a very powerful thing. And the fourth tempter is our base, Kevin Langan, yes. right, who's coming back after many appearances at San Diego Opera, so you know he too is family. And yeah, it's funny, when I called him, he had read the play, and in the play, and even in the score, it's mentioned that the fourth tempter is a shadow mm -hmm. on the wall. And Kevin said, oh great, I can read it from the score. I said, oh not great, <laughs> you're going to be on stage. And I thought, Well he was thinking he'd be backstage yes, or off stage. He was <laughs> thinking he would just project something and, and he could relax in his street clothes. Uh, no way. But I said, no Kevin, you're going to be a very important part. And there's an image uh, which I probably uh, will use. Uh, there's something I want to do at the end of Act One. I want Kevin as the fourth tempter who is said to be a martyr. I want him to put a crown of thorns on Beckett's head mm -hmm. because in a sense Beckett has made the decision to sacrifice himself for the church by saying God can make the decision uh, the way Christ sacrificed himself for mankind and I see very close parallels in fact the arrival of Beckett is announced as being on horseback going through the crowds outside Canterbury they're throwing flowers it's Jesus. Yes, yeah. Uh, exactly. And there are many of these parallels all the way through. So we're going to try to show just a couple of them. But it's not a religious story. It's a story about a religious conflict. Yeah. So we're not trying to turn it into a duplication of Christ. We're not playing silly games with it. We're telling the story, which is what I think a director should do. Tell us a little bit about the set. We're building the set in our uh, San Diego Opera Scenic Studio. It was designed by Ralph Funicello, who, although yeah. is internationally known, nationally known, happens to live here in San Diego, teach at San Diego State. Um, uh, Dimitza is doing the costumes. Yes. Um, the set uh, was come by with a little bit of difficulty. Ralph did uh, Don Quixote with me, and we wanted a pretty realistic set. Which is wonderful. And it Don worked, Quixote works beautifully. It worked beautifully. In the case of this, we began with abstraction. He came in with a remarkable set, which was uh, piles of uh, pillars and things broken, going in different directions, lying on the floor. To me, it was very appealing, but I don't think it would have spoken to the audience as clearly as having a representation of a church and a mm -hmm. cathedral. So we have lots of vertical pillars. Nothing is breaking down. The church is not broken down. Um, the conflict is between the king and Beckett, uh, the Pope's involved externally because of politics, but the church is still intact. Mm -hmm. So we've come up with um, columns, steps, and some open space. We will be able to light it, interestingly, because we can make shadows with the pillars. We have stained glass at the back, which a is reproduction, a reproduction, actually, a reproduction of, of the actual Thomas window. Which absolutely. Is in, in, uh, in fact, there will be a, a show cloth, which will show Thomas Beckett and the King, mm. taken from uh, later, of course, um, windows that were made, right. you know, leaded windows. Um, most of the images were made much later of him, um, but they still depict uh, an interesting man, yeah. interesting face. So the set will be a unit. It won't change uh, very much. We'll have the windows maybe go away at one point. We're not sure. There'll be a lectern from which he will give his sermon. 
So a lot of it will look fairly traditional, but because the women are there, there will be a different picture mm. made. Uh, they're not going to be congregation in the strict sense, right. nothing like that. Right. And then we have the unique thing of two people called choristers, two women. The Corypheia. Corypheia. Yeah. Um, which sounds as though they're fairy choristers or <laughs> yeah. something. But they, they're most interesting because they have major moments. It's a soprano and a mezzo-soprano. But they sort of talk to the chorus and they tell us as an audience what's been happening in, in their lives while he has been away. And the only really set aria is for the soprano. That's uh, right, at the chorus. opening of the second act. Yep. It's got the shape of an aria. Um, Beckett gets many thoughtful solo passages. Monologues. Monologues. Sense, yeah. uh, rather like Boris. Yes. They're, they're not really extractable. Mm -hmm. um, and the fact that the female chorus, the soprano, gets this set piece is very interesting because, again, it brings us up to speed right. with what has been going on in that month. There are many historic references to things that happened, um, things that Beckett and the King experienced, and they're mentioned actually by one of the tempters. We met here. Mm -hmm. um, and that's interesting because it's coming back to the fact that Beckett already had many of these thoughts sure. earlier, and now they just get compounded. And uh, I get back to what I began with. It's interesting to have this historical figure um, of whom we know a great deal now because so much research has been done. But one has to be careful about pulling history into the piece that can't be explained. Right. You can't act out what happened when he debated the, uh, the Clarendon document. Um, things like that you've got to be very wary of because the audience only knows the story you're telling. You can't expect them to know the backstory that's right. any depth of that's all. Right. That, that's not yeah. the way it should be. The cast is very dense. It's a huge cast. Right. But I'm impressed by the fact that you've got people in these roles that are relatively minor. I mean, the, really the only big role is Thomas. All right. of the others are relatively short. They, they come in and out, and there are so many of them. But um, I, I think that it sounds like I'm buttering you up. I'm not. But <laughs> the fact is that you know all of these folks have uh, have great experience. For instance, our Harold Alan Glassman is a Schwiski, is an Otello, and, and mean, he was just with us as Herod. As Herod, as Herod exactly. Well, what I think is interesting: these parts are small, but so important that many of our leading singers and, and major uh, secondary level singers uh, who may not have done this anywhere else were delighted to come and do them with, our, uh, with us. Because Which is great. They yeah. see it as a fascinating piece. Well, Susan Nevs, Susan Nevs. who is a um, major soprano, doing great a lot of work, and yeah. Abigail and Nabucco, yes. and she's singing our first chorus, the chorus. Now, uh, Susan was chosen because I think she's got the weight of voice for it, but the role has a high tessitura, so it sits way up there frequently, yeah. and she can sustain that, right. which, which is great. Getting back to Alan Glassman, the role of the Herald adds up to about five minutes on stage. Uh -huh. But he's a part of the very beginning of the piece, and he's the one who declares that Beckett is coming. And we need in that a, a very declarative statement. It's got he's to got rain, the doesn't it? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think the casting generally is stronger than it was at La Scala. And every one of these people, except two, has been a regular with us for some years. So it gives us a kind of ensemble of people who know each other, who can work together very quickly and easily, whose styles and habits I know. And I think we can come up with something special. And I think the audience is going to hear that. So thank you um, for the production of Murder in the Cathedral. Thanks for spending some time with us. I, I, I appreciate it. My pleasure. Much. It's always good fun. We'll see you at the opera. <laughs>